In this lesson, we are moving on to towards, shall we say, the, the final of our major topics. We've still got a couple more for the Brezhnev era, which is from 1972 to 1985, but we're starting to look at the implications for the Cold War in the 1980s. Now, the 1980s is really where we start to see the Cold War beginning to end. 1989 is really where a lot of the breakup of the Soviet Union begins. And so we've got a new picture. We've got a, a, a Michel Gor a, a Mikhail Gorbachev, should I say. Uh, we have Ronald Reagan and an individual who I don't know. Uh, leave in the comments if you know who that third person is. And we're going to talk about the Cold War in the 1980s. Okay, we're going to talk a little bit more about the emerging of a second Cold War that begins to take place. Um, as we move from the end of the 1970s, which was sort of a period marked by detente, into the 1980s, which is a period uh, marked by let's say uh, a second cold war and uh, the a new vigor invigoration of ideas of political ideas that position themselves away from communism in the sense of uh, reagan and thatcher and the sort of new neoliberal uh, growth of 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 global politics as well as towards the end of the 1980s a decline in the soviet union until its culmination in its collapse so as I've mentioned, and as uh, is seen on screen here, the election of new leaders as part of the Cold War becomes quite instrumental in this particular process. So, whereas before, with the United States and the United Kingdom to a lesser extent, the Cold War generally seemed to have a general unanimity among the different political parties now there was obviously differences between republicans and democrats as to how to handle certain parts of the cold war their ideological outlook towards um, communism for example but they seem to have a general agreement in things like for example containment as a as an idea for the communist uh, for, for how to deal with communism hostility towards the soviet union generally as well and this is really why there's a, a certain amount of unanimity among um certain foreign policy decisions there's a reason why the cold war and sorry the vietnam war was a conflict that spread across multiple presidents from both political parties because there was this belief in things like containment. It was only in the 1980s that we start to see a something of a shift towards different ideological positions towards the Soviet Union. And Ronald Reagan in the United States and Margaret Thatcher in the United Kingdom really did exemplify a quite harsh hostility towards the Soviet Union and towards communism from an ideological perspective. They were both incredibly conservative. They were both uh, very much pushed for quite disastrous economic policies in, in hindsight. And they both positioned themselves as inherently and quite explicitly anti-communist. They had commitments to neoliberalism and anti-communism, and it provoked a new policy towards the USSR as a result. They also, because sharing, they shared quite similar beliefs, and they were also very, very friendly with each other, um, had almost a unified force against communism in both countries. So let's think again about the end of détente. So the policy of détente, as we know, rested essentially on the notion that the two uh, superpowers needed detente for whatever reason that may be now we didn't touch on this explicitly but we implied this was the case uh, in the lesson on detente um one of the reasons for a a a policy of detente being a motivation for both sides was because there was an experience of stagnation in terms of economic development for both sides so both sides both experienced stagnation in terms of their economy in the 1970s and early 1980s and so as a result of this, they wanted to take away uh, some of the focus and some of the financial uh, contributions towards the Cold War and put that money really into places that were more important. So for the USSR, for example, that involved uh, less military spending and more consumer goods spending, for example. So the policy of detente rested on the notion that both superpowers were experiencing a certain amount of stagnation in terms of their economic development. And so they both needed a, an easing of tension to try and reduce that burden. Now, when it became clear, however, that the capitalist West was beginning to improve economically as we go into the 1980s, there was less of a need on the part of the US to adhere to this policy of detente because essentially they had come out of this period of stagnation and they were becoming to be uh, essentially becoming more economically prosperous. So 
what this meant was while detente was useful in allowing both sides to essentially uh, get rid take away some of their focus from the cold war and focus it on some other important issues while stagnation was taking place when the u.s no longer had that burden when the u.s no longer had an interest in implementing a policy of detente because their economy was beginning to recover the policy was less important and the idea of detente is that it would require um, both sides to implement it would not be a, a very good policy if one side did not want detente and did not want to implement a, an easing of tension while the other side did. It has to be mutual between both parties. And in addition to a clear lack of an interest in detente, the policy was also relatively controversial in government. There were a number of key advisors of the Carter administration who were divided on it, and this becomes especially important when we start to think about the invasion of Afghanistan, essentially blowing detente out of the water. You have, for example, um, the National Security Advisor Berensky uh, opposing the policy of detente and uh, always opposing the policy of detente. And then a policy of detente fails in 1979, or at least in January 1980, when the Carter uh, Doctrine becomes implemented. This quite hostile approach to and response to the USSR's invasion of Afghanistan. We then have the election of Ronald Reagan, and Ronald Reagan is there smiling on that screen here. And Ronald Reagan was elected president of the United States in November 1980, so the November 1980 election. He was a very right-wing Republican politician who was a former movie star and supported an increase in military spending and a very clear anti-communist outlook in terms of his other ideological positions. He believed communism was evil, essentially. Now... The Reagan doctrine, due to the success of Reagan in both elections, winning re-election again uh, four years later, um, the Reagan doctrine was implemented in 1981 and it wouldn't end until 1991. Now, one of the reasons why it wouldn't end till after Reagan um, assumes office is because Reagan will be replaced by his vice president, um, who is Bush senior uh, george hw bush and george bush uh, will obviously because being his vice president has very similar ideological and policy commitments to reagan as well so it would continue through um ronald reagan's uh, election campaign run through his re-election campaign run all the way to the election of george uh, bush senior now reagan doctrine the reagan doctrine took an aggressive approach against communism wherever it spread essentially so with the it results in the supporting of non-communists um, in all kinds of different parts, so all kinds of different areas of the world. So, for example, the Global South, uh, as well as in Africa uh, and in Latin America. And we will see this as we start to think about this in a future lesson when we focus specifically on Africa and Latin America uh, as, as regions where communism and, and the Cold War uh, was fought and really where some quite major controversial uh, uh, problems essentially take place you have things like the uh, iran contra scandal you have the intervention of uh, of the united states in nicaragua that goes all the way to the international court of justice all of these things um, are all part of the reagan doctrine this aggressive approach of communism wherever it's spread so we'll start to see like i said uh, more intervention in u.s uh, of, of the u.s in affairs of latin america and africa in future lessons time now this is not to say that the u.s on its own was interfering in these regions as well other communist states were also interfering you have the interference of cuba in africa you have the interference of the ussr in other regions of the world as well it's not like these communist um, uh, expansions, these communist revolutions that are taking place in the global south were not being supported and, uh, and encouraged by other states like the USSR and like Cuba and like China. And that they just sort of came out of nowhere within these particular regions and the US were the only ones that were intervening. There was a lot of meddling in foreign affairs from both sides of the conflict and both sides were very controversial in doing so, especially the United States. And while the Reagan con uh, doctrine can be contrasted as one that is inherently aggressive, so inherently anti-detente, it also attempts to make some uh, negotiate some political commitments. So, for example, you have the START Treaty, which is the Strategic Arms Reduction Treaty, uh, which began in 1981. Talks broke down in 1982 due to a feeling um, uh, by the USSR that the US was not really serious in the talks because one of the difficulties with the implementation of the reagan doctrine is that you have this outward 
and a very clear aggression towards uh, communism and, a, and, and an attempt to stop and contain communism wherever it spread, that doesn't seem to reconcile with another aim of the Reagan doctrine, which was to try and be um, uh, diplomatic in certain areas as well. So you have the Strategic Arms Reduction Treaty that is an attempt of peaceful settlement and something that is akin to a detente-style policy uh, in 1981. But this is also in conjunction with all of the aggressive uh, anti-communist rhetoric and anti-communist policies that the Reagan Doctrine was implemented elsewhere. So, of course, it was quite hard to balance both of these different things. You, can either have one, you can't really have one foot in both camps. You can either be fully aggressive or fully peaceful. It's, it's quite difficult to do both. In addition to this, we also have, of course, the election of Margaret Thatcher. Now, we know that Margaret Thatcher and Ronald Reagan shared a number of ideological commitments. Uh, one of these was, of course, a commitment towards conservatism, neoliberalism, and this concept of Reaganomics. So Reaganomics was essentially an economic policy, an economic idea, which is sometimes described as trickle-down economics. And it was the idea that you can stimulate economic growth within, uh, a, 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 within a national economy by making quite significant tax reductions on the wealthiest within society. The idea being that if you don't tax the wit, the rich as much as you are taxing them, if you reduce their tax uh, burden, their tax incentives, um, you essentially allow them to have more money. They then spend more money. That money then goes into the economy, which then trickles down to the lower uh, classes within society and allows them to benefit as well. Now, without trying to uh, without trying to impose my own political and economic ideologies onto the, <laughs> this series of lessons, uh, Reaganomics and trickle down economics has been shown not to work. It doesn't work as an idea. There's a very key reason for that. That's because rich people, um, the, the wealthiest in society, will uh, save at a greater rate than they spend compared that to the lower people, uh, the lower people, the lower classes of society, and so as such, all. All reducing a tax incentive, uh, tax burden does to people in the wealthy society is allow them to accumulate and to save uh, vast amounts of wealth, which does not necessarily trickle down at the same kind of rate. There's a little bit of trickling down, but it does not it does it does not pay off given the percentage of saving that they are doing. That's what Reaganomics is, and. Essentially, Thatcher and Reagan got on well, and this was important to Thatcher since she was looking to instantiate the special relationship that was had between the US and the United Kingdom. And they had this special relationship. They had this quite interesting close relationship between the two um, politicians, and this led to a number of elements of cooperation. So, for example, Thatcher would support the decision that was made by Ronald Reagan to bomb Libya in 1986. And Thatcher also got concessions by Reagan by way of the extradition of IRA terrorists back to the United Kingdom. IRA, Irish Republican Army, um, again, for those who are studying this module specifically, you are probably not studying a module that covers the uh, 1980s in the United Kingdom, uh, the, the troubles with Northern Ireland, the politics of Margaret Thatcher. But we do have a series of lessons already on the making of modern Britain, which covers this topic. So if, like I've said, like uh, and like with the other um, uh, topics that you might have an interest in, if you have a general interest in this uh, that goes beyond specifically the exam that you're going to be taking uh, next month uh, or, or whenever this uh, video is released, um, you should, you know, you can go and have a look and see a bit more detail about the treatment of the IRA terrorists by, by Margaret Thatcher and the sort of her sort of policy towards the IRA during the Troubles. But again, this is not part of this particular series of lessons because we're covering the Cold War. And so um, these were some areas of cooperation. Now, like I've said, the next lesson is going to focus a little bit more on um, the Cold War in the 1980s, specifically in other theatres. So talking about Latin America, talking about Africa and talking about how uh, the intervention of the USSR and the United States in those regions were detrimental to those regions, but also um, uh, led to a policy of containment in those regions that were very controversial and are still controversial to this day.